Thank you very much, Devon. <clears throat> and thank you. And, and to you, Mr. President, and the Board of Directors, and the delegates, I'll clarify one thing. My family, I have five boys and five girls. I don't know. I said when I, when Devon said he was going to put me on the platform at this time, I said, what am I going to say? All the speakers have spoken. What do I really do? Now Phil steps up here. I'm not only afraid or don't know what I'm going to say, I don't even know how I'm going to say it. <laughs> Phil threw me a double blow. I, what do I do, Phil? Leave out everything with S's in it? It's hard to hear back of this. I hope that I can adequately express my feelings today and get my thoughts to you. There are three things that I'm going to say that are absolutely true. You are right in what you're doing, you are a winner, and you are a leader. You just pick them out as I go along and what I'm going to cover. Nearly every place I go, even this convention, out in the hall, several people have sat down with me or caught me in the hall and said, how are things going in the NFO? In staff meetings, they say, how are things going in the NFO? And in 30 minutes, their complete attitude can be turned from being negative or thinking things are bad until to recognizing the gains that you've made. Rene Neese came to me one day and he said, Ed, we want to send a letter out to our delinquent members, those who haven't paid their dues. Maybe they've forgotten them, maybe they don't have the money, uh, maybe they're upset about something and they haven't paid their dues. And I said, well, Rene, I'd like to give you my ideas what to say to them in a letter. And it would be the same thing that I'm going to tell you today or tell a staff meeting, at a staff meeting, and they feel better. You've heard it today, and I'll only recap it, but this is the letter. And I said, you know, after I read it, I believe we tell our delinquent members more good news than we tell our members. And I said, this is what we ought to be showing to all of our members. And Devon touched on all of those the other night, but I want to read the letter that went to the delinquent members, not to you that are participating and paying your dues and doing everything you can. It says, Dear NFO member, when compared to the USDA Marketing Reporting Service, NFO has led the cow cow markets in Wisconsin for the past 34 months. Devon touched on all of these. Number two, NFO has grain sales averaging in the top one-third of the market price range when 90 percent of the independent sellers market in the bottom one-third of the price range. Number three, NFO has hog contracts with the largest hog killer in the United States under one roof, slaughtering nothing but one and two hogs. NFO has forward contracting on hogs with guaranteed prices. NFO has moved into a position to put strategic grain reserve program into producer control. An independent survey by Polster indicates 74% of the farmers listening and 65% knowing they want NFO marketing help. NFO has been proven right on the dairy issues at the 8th Circuit, 8th District Court of Appeals. NFO has media coverage where it counts Prairie Farmer and Big Farmer magazines being read by the top producers in this country. I wish you could read the letter that was sent to Devon Woodland by Big Farmer asking us for the information. We don't have to call them, they're calling us saying, we want to explain your program to the, I think, Devon, it's 200,000 of the largest farmers, progressive farmers in the nation. I believe he said 100. 
As I remember, it says 200,000 of the top farmers. NFO has respected the industry for product quality and quantity. I don't know if you know this, but not too far from here, it was in uh, Tennessee, Seal Test opened their books to me one day on milk. Said, I want to show you the best milk we get, quality, is from the National Farmers Organization. I don't know if I ever told you that to dairy farmers. You had less milk rejected than any of the other suppliers of seal test in Nashville, Tennessee. So in summary, NFO is on the roll. The success that you and we have worked so hard for is in our reach. When, why not participate by adding your production to the nationwide system and getting into the action? Be a part of a winning team. Participate in your programs and pay your dues to your county treasurer. Sincerely, Devon Woodland. And that letter impressed me enough that that was a statement I, I made. I said, I think we tell our delinquent members and maybe our non-participating members more of the good things than we have an opportunity to tell you. Well, the survey said that people want to know if you can do what you say you're doing. When Bill Smith was talking about it, I wasn't in here, but I'm sure he covered that. Braniff Gran covered the history of farm organizations this morning. And again, the survey points out to us what they want, what the farmer wants, and they tell us that they want the NFO. But they do say that the producers out there don't necessarily know what NFO is. They think they know what NFO is. And there's a big difference. Gene Potter always said, it's not necessarily what the facts are, it's what people think are the facts that determine what a person does. So that points out, of course, what we have to do, and Bob Arndt has just outlined a few things here that's going to help. How many would agree with me that in 1960, we really had a lot of enthusiasm in the National Farmers Organization? We did, didn't we? We had enthusiasm. In 1970, we built a structure under almost impossible odds. When I listened to Devon tell and make statements about that lawsuit the other day, I'll tell you, there's very few people know how close they came to doing exactly what they set out to do to break the back of NFO. They didn't know then, they can know now, but they were in a matter of days. And the doors would have been closed if it hadn't been for you people. It wasn't next month. We sat in meetings on Saturday and had to have help or the doors would have closed by Wednesday. If you think there weren't pressure times, we had to rely on you. And you always came through. In the 1980s, we recognized through the survey that now was the time the image had to be changed. And I want to say, as I said to a reporter out here today, this organization never has to apologize for what we did in the 60s and the 70s. You never have to apologize for what you do because we said now we need to change the image. It's because those who didn't know why those things had to be done. And remember, since World War II, there's been about 200 farm organizations made an attempt to do something, and you're the only one that made it. So we couldn't have done things that wrong. <clears throat> you know why we got sued, don't you? Why don't you get sued when you protest? Well, nobody worries about protesters. They worry about you with the programs you have. Ben Stong, who probably knew more about the history of agriculture, farm programs, government circles, what people were thinking, than anyone in this room said your biggest danger of losing your organization is when you move production. And he was right. That's when the lawsuit hit us. 
That's when everything was thrown against us, SEC. Everything they could, all the muscle they had. Well, now up till tonight, or today, in 1982, I have said at all the staff meetings, don't feel sorry for the farmers in 1982, save it till 1983. I've told that to staff. When staff personnel or farmers would say, look, you can't go out and sell a VIP to the grain producer, a volume incentive program. They have no money. I said, wait till 83. I hope I can turn these negatives into something real positive. I'm sure I can. Grain in 1982, the prices were bad, weren't they? Milk in 1983 is going to be worse than, than it was in 82, isn't it? They just instituted that tax. What do you think the cheap grain is going to do for the meat prices next year, 83? It'll drop them, won't it? Lloyd Fairbanks said to me last night, or yesterday, he said, yeah, we're making a little bit on some hogs, $10 a head. But he said, when you think of paying thirty and $40,000 for a tractor, it takes a lot of hogs to pay for that tractor, don't it? So if you think of making $10 a head on a hog, it isn't right. It's got to be brought up comparable to what you have to pay for what you need to buy. And we've gone through and lived through the time of pie in the sky. What we're talking about isn't pie in the sky. The only reason to change the image of this organization is to get participation. To get participation from those non-members and some of the members that really never understood what the National Farmers Organization had to do to get to where we are today. Some points to remember. You have acceptance of the industry, don't you? You've been proven legal in every respect, and you've been tested. You have raised the prices of dairy, haven't you? You've raised the prices of dairy in the Minnesota-Wisconsin series area, haven't you? No doubt about it. And that's what we set out to do. In grain, I didn't work in grain, but I remember, uh, I believe it was white corn, sales of white corn, sales of soybeans, raising the price of grain, and meat in northeastern Iowa. You people from Iowa know what that did for the price of pork right in that area. I said the news media is ready to cover you, giving you good reports. You've got politi political respect. You have contracts. There's something interesting I don't think Devon told you. And this seemed to be of interest to many of our staff people and uh, members that I had a chance to talk to. You remember Dairy Day in Washington, D.C. this past year? They floated a big cow, I think, over the Capitol. They had a hot dog 145 foot long or something like that. Well, Devon Woodland was going to, the, to Washington, D.C. And they met him on the plane and said, hurry up, you're wanted at the capital, at the nation's capital. Dairy princesses were there. A big day to promote dairy products. Block was called somewhere, he couldn't be there. And who do you think they asked if he'd come up at the nation capital, cut the big uh, hot dog, it wasn't hot dog, I guess they had something else in it, submarine sandwich. They asked Devon Woodland and passed the sandwiches out at the nation's capital with all the dairy leaders standing all around wondering why the National Farmers Organization president was called upon. You have more respect than any of you, I think, really know. In the highest of circles and with agriculture and with producers today that we need, we want, and we'll soon have in the organization. What was the biggest thing, I think, that changed the image of the National Farmers Organization? I believe it was the movement of food to Poland. I'll give you an example of where you stand on that one. First of all, it was a humanitarian movement, wasn't it? 
you did move food to hungry people. And that food went to the elderly, the disabled, and to children. And you know when they talk about moving food from this country to other nations, only about 10% of it is really gets to the people. 90% of it is used for political reasons and the military. So you made that move, and it proves, secondly, that what did it say when you joined the National Farmers Organization, that we would move, I'll use the word surplus, I don't like it, I'd rather say inventory, into secondary markets to the needy people. It proved we can do it. It proves we can move it anywhere in the world. Now in contrast to that, how many of you people from Iowa have seen on the news recently where there's a movement to move a million bushel of grain? I believe to Poland, put it together, Northwest Iowa. Do any of you see that on the news? See the hands go up? Sure. Well, they're calling the NFO to find out how to do it. That's right, Reverend Ross Winner. <laughs> Called me two weeks ago and wanted to know. Devon wasn't able to take the call. He said, how do we do it? We're having some problems. But they said, a million bushel. Less than two weeks ago, now this has been going on for two, three months, less than two weeks ago in the Des Moines paper, they had $600 and 1,500 bushel of grain. That's how successful you are if you aren't organized. They have hopes. But you did what you said you were going to do, and we moved it. Now we're faced with this milk tax. This milk tax may be a blessing in disguise. I may get tomatoes thrown at me for that one. But that milk tax is going to be very, very successful for the USDA and for those who want cheap food. It will be very disastrous for the producer and very successful for the Budget Bureau. <clears throat> but really, it's a surplus disposal program come up by the government. The membership agreement in 1958 gave them the answer to the problem, and that was for the surplus disposal program. And you know what we talked about, selling off bread heifers, when we could see it coming. I said I was going to show you where we were right. Do you know that two years ago I met with all the dairy leaders in the nation and proposed a plan to stop two years ago what you're faced with this month in the nation and told them that they would have to use a program to eliminate the cows that were producing the milk. And you know we had fine reception from major cooperatives, AMPI, Mid-America, various cooperatives across the country except California. I told them that day I'd be happy as could be to put the signature of the National Farmers Organization and a dairy cooperative on the same letter, encouraging farmers to market cows to stop what was going to happen in two years. One year ago, Andy Nutzling from the Meat Department met with some of those same people in Chicago and told them about your orderly marketing system, how we could forward contract and we would not destroy the beef prices. The farmers we had talked to were receptive. The leaders, no. And they got exactly what they wanted today, a chance to drop the price of milk and take the money back from the farmer. So you have been right. Less than six months ago, we gave them a, another idea of two or three hundred million dollars. They could solve their problem by putting an incentive on these cows. Again, the farmer was receptive, but the government isn't. They chose the tax. They're doing it at the expense of the highest unemployment ever seen in this country. They're doing it at the expense of increasing the indebtedness of agriculture. 
They're doing it at the expense of having farmers being sold out. There are farmers in this audience that told me they didn't believe they'd be in business next year. And there's fully as many that are not here in the same position. And they're doing it at the expense of soup lines in Des Moines, Iowa. And we heard somebody from this podium say yesterday, it isn't very bad. Let me tell you how bad it is. Less than six months ago, a young man brought his daughter, nine years old, to the soup lines in Des Moines, Iowa, the breadbasket of the nation, and said to the man running the, heading this up, a church group giving food away, a meal a day, Mr. Could my daughter have something to eat? He says she won't eat much. And they fed her, and the man running it said she ate three times as much as I could have eaten. You think it isn't bad? In that same soup line two weeks ago, one man stabbed and killed another man. Do you know why? No work, stress, affecting the American people. And somebody here says it's not as bad as we're making out. How many more of those can we show you? They don't want to tell me it's not as bad. I'm going to repeat something now that was said at an NFO convention in 1971, and I'm going to just comment on the headlines of the paragraphs. Think of it. When I say you were right, 1971. Here's the headlines from each paragraph. It starts out, your chances are better in Las Vegas than in agriculture. If any of you rode the TWA plane or will ride it this month, pick up the little magazine ahead of your seat. With blackjack, you have a half to one and a half percent favoring the player. Your chances are better in Las Vegas than in agriculture with the cards stacked against you. That amazed me. I thought it was all in favor of the House. This man was right in 71. He said in 71, one dollar generated in agriculture multiplies at seven dollars. The next paragraph was headed, 182,000 tractors will never be sold. You've seen John Deere, International Harvester, and those people, haven't you? The tractors that aren't being sold. The next paragraph was entitled, Lost Profits to Businessmen. Ask your businessmen. Remember, 71, keep that in your mind. This man said, high interest rates, unemployment, inflation. The next paragraph, he, he dwelled strictly on unemployment. And today, the largest number in history, unemployed. The next paragraph is entitled, Welfare from the Government is Not Free. The next paragraph, two million business bankrupt due to low farm prices. The next paragraph, and think of this, 71 again, 25% of the national income to pay the interest. We didn't even have enough income to pay our interest. Think how right leaders of the organization have been. And number 10 was doomed to relive history. And he was talking of the Great Depression. And then he finally said, we're ready for a revolution. And then he explained why this country didn't have a revolution. It was the voice of a man. And this guy, this fellow always had some humor to make a point. I want to make it today. 
He explained and almost apologized to the delegates from Texas when he said this was a Texan that told me this story, so don't think I'm picking on Texas. But he told about the big, tall Texan who was at the bar drinking, and the little short guy came up, elbowed his way up to the bar to get a drink. And it irritated the big Texan. He took his hand and he pushed him back, and the little guy just rolled in the back. But he got up. He was persistent. And he came up again, and the big, tall Texan just pushed him back again. He rolled over a couple times, but he still came back. And now the big Texan was getting pretty irritated. And so when he came up uh, the next time, he took his elbow and he hit him a good one. Figured that stopped him, the little guy came back. And the next time the Texan looked at him, he said, look, Shorty, you're irritating me. And if you attempt to do that once more, I'm going to show you some holes from various parts of the world. And the little guy was still persistent. He came back. And the Texan grabbed him by the hand and flipped him around and he went up in the air and he landed on his back and he said, in case you're interested, that's judo from Japan. The little guy was shook up, but he tried her once more. He came back and the guy gave him a chop on the Adam's apple. And he went rolling and he said, now, if you're interested in that one, that's karate from Korea. The little guy had about all he could take. So he left, but he came back. He walked up behind the big Texan, and he hit him over the head with something, and down he went. He wobbled, and his eyes rolled. Down he went. He walked up, and he ordered his drink, and he said to the bartender, in case that guy is interested, that was a jack handle from Sears Roebuck. <laughs> but he told that story to make a point to get the attention of people and be persistent. Then he ended with this phrase. He said, I want to remind you, it is very, very late. Unless we solve the problems through our organization and collective bargaining and do it fast, there will be nothing left for any of us. That's the way he ended his speech. And I thought how right he was 10 years ago. That was Erhard Fingston, a speech that he gave in 1971 and is called Trapped. I can't end my talk today on that because I've got something to add. I heard from this stage too of a young enthusiastic boy with the FFA, his faith in agriculture. And I heard a statement made that we ought to be educating the cons consumer. I want to tell you, in my opinion, it's too late to educate the consumer. Let me tell you why I think so. Kentucky, do you have a radio station called WINN? You do. I want to be sure that I had it right because that young lady from that station interviewed me the other day on the family farm. She said, I'd like to inv interview you on the family farm. And I said, I'd like to interview, interview you. I said, what, what is a family farm? And she said, well, I think it's about 240 acres. It's ran by, run by a man and his wife and their family, and they make their living on that farm. I said, you're not wrong, but somebody might give you an awful argument. I said, so I'm going to give you my viewpoint. Now, this didn't go on the air, what a family farm is. I say it's 3,000 acres, but you probably grow wheat. Or it might be a father and two sons. They have a, they've incorporated. They've got three or four families on it, but it's a family farm. I said, that's a very argumentative thing. But I said, it's, it's almost dangerous to talk about that because of how, what some people interpret as the family farm, because some think it's the 80 acres, the horse and the plow, and pump water out of a pump. I said, you know, this organization, organization is interested in ownership of the land. Who's going to control agriculture 
and who's going to own the land? And that's when I recognized it was too late to educate the consumer because she said, well, I have a farm background, but I worked in Boston before coming here for the radio station. And one day on one of the radio programs in Boston, the announcer was either asked or made the statement that a goose and a duck are the same.